struck me that in many ways, a NASA mission is really a very, very long road trip. You know, really do that road trip is, is expensive and, and can take a lot of time and take a lot of effort, right? And, and I like to think of Kepler as this road trip which, which Bill uh, embarked upon back in the 80s, uh, which is still uh, going on. And I'm going to assert in this talk that the road trip is going to continue for a long time. Uh, I, I, I see some people thinking, well, but you need fuel for a road trip, right? <laughs> well, actually, Caitlin just showed us that you can do a campaign without any fuel. <laughs> By the way, the work they did is incredible, and I encourage you all to go and talk to about that. Um, but actually, what happens with Kepler is that the momentum we have with the size of Kepler is so large that we can keep going uh, forward with this for the years to come. Kepler right now contributes to 1.6 publications every day, which has never been higher, and it's even significantly higher than it was at previous conferences or any time in the past. Kepler uh, has contributed, or okay, to have contributed to a total of 3,000 publications in the literature. Just last year alone, we had more than 500 papers. Uh, that's Kepler at, uh, at the playing field of NASA's Great which is an incredible achievement because Kepler is, of course, many times cheaper. And uh, I, I see Martin looking at me thinking, you know, at headquarters, we love funding for money. Isn't that right? And so, thank you, everybody, who made that happen. It's an incredible mission for many reasons, including. So the, the question I wanted to address in this talk is, will this continue, will Kepler's discoveries continue? Is there any science left to do? Well, if, if there wasn't any science left to do, we'd probably can leave it now. Is this, is this the end of the conference? And of course, I think that the answer is yes. I think there is a lot of science uh, left to do. And what I want to do in this talk is perhaps address some of the younger members of the audience, maybe people who just started their PhD, uh, who just are first early career stage graduate students, yes, there's still so many opportunities left in the Kepler data. And in particular, there's, there's, there's two big reasons why I think this is true. One is there's a lot of new data. You know, a lot of the K2 data was only collected over the last year. Um, the guy the R2 data release, in a way, changes the entire Kepler data set, because now we know where everything is. And, uh, we have a new Kepler data set, in a way, thanks to Kepler. Uh, there's new ideas, new methods, uh, many of which we presented at this meeting, and there's powerful new tools. You know, when Kepler was launched, it's crazy to think that things like MCMC or Beijing Influence or Machine Learning were not something that were frequently mentioned in, in papers or articles, right? And now they're becoming mainstream. And in particular, when it comes to opportunities that exist, I think it's a particular big and ambitious statistical analyses of our entire data set, which is now available, uh, which will lead to perhaps some of the biggest discoveries, uh, which perhaps still lie ahead. Um, the reason I think this is because I've always been a bit worried that the fast pace of the K2 data releases, you know, we release data every three months, naturally led people to focus on the quick discoveries, which is very normal, right? Like, because there's more data coming, so you just want to get this high value planned out so you can follow it up. But perhaps some of the more difficult and more time consuming discoveries were put aside. Some projects just generally benefit from having the full data set. If you want to compute occurrence rates of planets, you want to do it over as big as sample as possible. And, uh, I encourage you all to go and talk with Jeff Coffin, who's, who's somewhere here in this room, who leads the important project over there. Who leads the important effort to uh, calibrate the K2 data in a uniform way, which is ongoing right now. About this question. Um, and of course, uh, I'm a big fan of TESS. This is a beautiful mission with beautiful data. Uh, and I think the combination of TESS and Kepler is going to be powerful. Kepler does add uh, precision into the aperture and has a big baseline, uh, which will not be rivaled for many years. And it adds Goldman and is being replaced by this. So I think both missions will make each other better. I'm, I'm looking at Martin, who's from NASA headquarters, and he's just looking at me thinking, well, what are you talking about? Show me some examples, because, you know, you can say all of this stuff, you know, what are you talking about? Uh, well, I can answer that, because back in October, when uh, Katie and her team were uh, struggling to keep, to keep Kepler under control, because the fuel was really empty, there's not a single drop of fuel left in Kepler, right? 
uh, we took a uh, unanimous decision in the project to, to stop taking data because, you know, the fuel was out. Of course, when you lose uh, somebody you love, when you lose a relative, something that happens as part of the mourning process is sometimes you like to uh, tell stories about them and talk about them and process it that way. So, uh, I guess a way for us to process this like, turn of capital was to uh, write a white paper where we try to set out some ideas or summarize some of the key things we think uh, can still be done using capital data. Uh, so I don't have time to talk about 21 uh, projects here. I just picked seven examples. None of these examples are new or surprising. You will have, they come from the literature, from conferences. If you've attended these conferences before, you will have heard people talk about them. And there will be many talks on these topics here. It's for the benefit of perhaps uh, new members of the audience or early career researchers. I'll just very quickly uh, run them through seven projects, which I'm excited about. Are you ready? I have five minutes. That's perfect for seven questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one. We don't have a full catalog of kids who plants. Catalogs are important to prioritize follow up and to enable occurrence based studies. And many teams have published uh, catalogs to extract paint by campaign, but it's, it's somewhat inhomogeneous. And uh, now that we have the full K2 data set, we, uh, we're looking forward to seeing the full analyses of that data set. We think that only about 20 or 40 percent of the plants from K2 have been published so far. Of course, K2 complements this by having smaller plants or longer orbits. There's many talks at this meeting. Uh, on the K2 planet sample or on some benchmark systems from K2. And once you have those catalogs, you can uh, think about the current state of planets. A lot of amazing work has been done on that topic already. Uh, but it's perhaps worth to acknowledge that the, the final products from the mission, the plant catalog and the careful characterization of the completeness and reliability of the catalog, was only really published in the last few years. Uh, the Melania paper came out last year. And so, uh, whilst there have been amazing teams doing excellent work with that already, and I think we're going to hear uh, some of the, the thoughts later this afternoon, I think it's going to take time to really digest those products. And of course, the K2 mission has added to the Kepler sample by adding stars of a wide range of ages, instead of types, and the population populations that perhaps they won't allow us to understand the occurrence of problems as a function of those parameters. Um, I love circumbinary things, <coughs> I think they're really sweet. And of course they're important because we think that a lot of stars in our galaxy are in multiple systems. And so perhaps it's surprising that uh, I believe today we only have a handful of circumbinary parts. Um, this is just a theory without real confirmation from you, but is it perhaps because of the dynamical effects our planet searches struggle because circumbinary planets might experience irregular periods? Or is it perhaps because of the extra stars in the system which dilute the transit density that troubles and can a dedicated search help us understand the real frequency? And this is important because Alpha Centauri is a, is a multiple system. And then NASA, I see Martin looking thinking, you know, NASA might want to send expensive missions to go and explore the system. So. Uh, I'm also a big fan of transit timing variations. Uh, of course, we can help understand the planet masses, uh, which is neat. Again, perhaps our planet searches are missing some of the most extreme TTV systems because they're not exactly periodic. Uh, and now is the time to start working on this because K2 has overlapped a lot of its own fields in the last year or two of its mission. Of course, TESS is going to overlap with both K2 and Kepler fields. And so now is a great time to leverage the baseline of the Kepler to study TTVs. Kepler is a the star cluster. Including two star forming regions, and I think about 17 local clusters, and the others are old globular clusters. Um, I'm excited for people to, in a consistent way, apply our techniques and powerful tools of seismology, eclipsing binaries, chronology, uh, and planet studies, and to figure out, you know, do these clusters tell a consistent story? We think we know the age and composition of stars in clusters. So these are laboratories to test those methods and learn more. Archaeology is a really neat project. You know, we can get ages of giants from Kepler data. And there's a really neat paper last year really showing that there seems to be a strong correlation between age and composition for those giants. 
So I can't wait for people, and there will be many talks about this topic that is leading to, to show me whether when you apply this pattern across the K2 fields, does that tell you something about the history of the galaxy? Seven, K2 did capture a sample of supernovae. There's already a few papers out, I know the team is working on a whole sample of those supernovae. Uh, that's cool because Kepler has captured some of those supernovae explosions from before the start, through many weeks after the peak of the explosion. You know, that's the second we feel about, about supernovae. Because here we are with an exoplanet mission that's trying to address, you know, dark energy. Isn't that, isn't that new? And then there's all these other projects which I don't have time to talk about, but I'm equally excited to listen to your talks about that this week. And so if you want to learn more and sort of see our talks about this topic, we encourage you to go and look at the white paper. In the white paper for each of these 21 projects, you will see a link to a GitHub issue where we invite everyone to publish your thoughts. If you have any progress or you want to communicate and address about each of these topics, we welcome you to share this in the open forum. So to summarize, I, I really think that perhaps some of Kepler's biggest discoveries still are ahead of us because now is the time to, to investigate and utilize this big data cycle in a much use and consistent way and really focus on the main questions. We really don't need fuel to do the science, right? We need a lot of and smart people. And I see a lot of laptops and I see a lot of smart people. So um, I'm, I'm convinced that Kepler discoveries will continue. And I'm really excited um, to hear all your thoughts this week. Thank you.